He would only made a mistake. Yeah. So of course, it's a whole new world now. Yeah. It's a crazy world. So of course, I got my bodyguard. Hello. Is, is, is Joe your bodyguard? Joe, all, all through my life. We'll, we'll, we'll get into it. So you, so you guys grew up in? In, 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 in New York, Harlem. We grew up in East Harlem. East Harlem. East Harlem, yeah. Grandma was there, and then uh, we grew up in Harlem. You guys are we, twins. And then we moved to Long Island. Identical. Identical. Identical twins. Identical. Should we put the picture here? No, we did last time. Okay, okay. I'm the boy, he's the girl. <laughs> That's why I got away with being so flamboyant in school. You know what I'm saying? Because he was my buddy. But, but Joe was just telling me before you showed up that you were always a magnetic personality always people just always gravitated to towards you always yeah. had a gift people just attracted what, to yeah. what, what is it about you that makes you so <clears throat> I don't I think it's a little bit of my mom and my dad honestly like my father was very like charismatic my father was very cool it's the Italian thing too he's the Italian yeah, he was a you know he was very quiet but cool you know what I'm saying but and I'm um, always cool like he was always like the best at everything he did like he was going to be on the the, the Mets, right? He tried out for the Mets. Red Sox. The Red Sox. He was handsome. A stud. He was a stud. Good looking man. Tall, dark, handsome. Stud. I mean, he was just good looking. Everybody said he should have been a, a, an actor. He was a great Model. athlete. Yeah. He got a contract with Boston Red Sox He should, for shortstop. And then he wind up hurting his shoulder. But, um, but he was always like the man. Yeah, he was always yeah, the man. He, he, was, uh, he worked in the Palm Restaurant. You know, he was serving like Johnny Carson and Larry Flint. And he would come home and tell us all the stories. But he was always like the man. How did your dad feel about you being, being gay? Or well, growing up, you know, it's like um, he, 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 he knew. You know what I mean? It's like some kids like switch at a certain age. I was never in the closet. I just came storming out of the closet. <laughs> you were born. I came out storming out. And when I was one and two years old, I would put my mother's heels on and put a towel on my head and be like, Mommy, I'm going to marry Davy Jones, which I shared, you know. <laughs> and I would walk around with towel on my head. I'm like, Mom, look, Mom, I got long hair. So we just had this fixation of having long hair. So now I have the long hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, my father knew. My father I knew. Surprised when I he threw the baseball, he threw the baseball, right? Boom. When I threw the baseball, I was like... <laughs> Like that, you know what I mean? So your father's the first one to know, but my mom didn't think my father knew. It was so weird. So she was trying to hide it, but you could not hide me. No, when, when a straight no, guy a straight, sees a, another yeah, male you, you throw a ball like that, yeah. we cringe. Right. We may not say anything, <laughs> but we just, there's this silent cringe. So me. basically he's like, okay, I, you know, I knew my father knew I was gay. So then, but you cut two years later, um, I started playing paddle ball and I got really good, right? Competitive, great power great power so handball and paddle ball. Great I just power picked power. it we up. Who knew I was gonna like kill it? You know what I mean. So I'm playing handball, and with this Puerto Rican guy, and then he became like my lover, like at 13 years old, my first lover. So my best friend. He's seducing the neighborhood. All the football players, like it was fabulous. The wise guy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the gangsters, all of that. The gay boys yeah. are always f sexual faster, aren't they? Yeah. Well, you know, I was a pretty kid, you know what I mean? And the girls weren't having it. So I was like, here I am, hi. But um, in the neighborhood full of like macho men, like my brother, you know. Uh, so um, what was I saying? Yeah, everybody just flocked around him. It was just like everybody gravitated to him. Everybody loved him. Like I said, we grew up in a tough neighborhood, East Harlem, New York. And, uh, you know, there was wise guys, there was gangsters, there was killers, there was drug addicts. You know what I mean? And everybody, I ne never really had a problem. And number one, nobody would mess with us because we, you know, I would never let anybody mess with us. What, what were you guys like in high school? Mm -hmm. uh, high school, we just, uh, I played sports and uh, big into sports. And uh, he did his thing. You know what I mean? I did my thing. He did his thing. But you guys have always gotten along. Always kind of, yeah, but we, listen, we had our bouts. I mean, you know what? We were in the same womb. We were in the same crib growing up. So, you know what? Naturally, we'd we, we, we go at it. we bunk heads. You know, we'd bunk heads. You know, big, you we know, would have some fist fights. We, yeah. we, we'd have, we, you know, we'd throw down. He's tough. He's tough as hell. Tough as nails. I mean, I wouldn't mess. He saved my ass a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. No, he was my protector, but there was many times I had to protect him. He was there. But I learned, I, you know, you're in New York, you're from in Harlem. You got to learn how to, I was, I dance and I had to learn how to fight, you know, and they taught me and my father would definitely put the boxing gloves on us and show us how to fight. You know, we had to protect ourselves. Yeah, it was the he, worst neighborhood, you know, tough. and my father I, I, saw that. I take him over all the straight people because he's got my back. 
<laughs> you know, one time I had a fight in the city. I remember we had a fight on 57th Street coming out of the Ice Palace, remember? And I was fighting with the guy, and the guy went to the garbage pail, and he picked up a pipe, right? And I went to go pick up, and then he hit me in my, my, my hands, right? Broke my hands, my fingers, right? Then he was going to hit me again, and Cosmo just comes running up alongside, and I see him come with a fucking roller skate, and bang! <laughs> fucking knock. I mean, saved my ass. This guy would have cracked me with yeah. the pipe. I would have, you know, it would have been over. But, you know, he, he's always had my, yeah. you know, with you know, we got each other's back. It was, you know, till, it was rough. To this day, we have each other's back. New York was so, rough, and I'm glad I had him. And I have an older brother, too, who kind of, like, protected us, you know? So he had, like, a reputation. And then Joey had a reputation for being an athlete. Joey would play hockey. Joey was, like, the man, like my father. He was, like, the man. Me, I have my mother's personality, too. She's very vivacious, very beautiful, big personality, did everything. Give her, give her, give her, give her, give her. So I guess that's the combination. And then, you know, here I came, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for their, for their, their contribution. And you guys moved to L.A. at what age? We were 17, yeah, 17. 17 years old, yeah. That's an interesting age to move from yeah. New York yeah. City. It was hard. We, I, we had to go back to New York because what was involved in some stuff and they had a case going and whatever and anyway the case wound up being thrown out and then he just was like you know I'm, you know I'm gonna go you know go straight and um, he wind up my uncle my uncle junior worked at the palm out here so my uncle junior you know palm was a great you're job. familiar with the palm not just anybody can get a job in the palm you know what I mean? It's a yeah, phenomenal it's job for you know for a waiter. I mean, waiters they owned uh, race horses and uh, you know was driving horses and but uh, we got the job in the Palm and then uh, we moved to uh, yeah moved to California. We moved to Encino. And, uh, and he wanted to go straight and narrow my father, like no more mafia, no more this, no more that, no more staying out for two weeks, going to Puerto Rico. I was like, you know, where's my father? He's in Puerto Rico. You know, where's my father? He's in the Bronx. He's gambling for two weeks. So he wanted to come out, and his brother, my uncle Junior, actually was a Jehovah's Witness, right? He converted from Catholic, you know, from being Catholic to Jehovah, you know. And my grandmother converted too, like overnight. Now, my grandmother was a devout Catholic; she's going to church every Sunday. And then all of a sudden, these Jehovah's Witness come over the house, and then next thing you know, we can't have birthdays, <laughs> we can't, we can't, um, we can't celebrate Christmas. This is like we're eight years old. That okay, was, that was devastating. Then my mother said, "Hell with this shit," you know. Yeah. And then we just went to grandma's house in Harlem and we celebrated Christmas, and that was the end of the Joe. Yeah, the, my, and my mother the tried, this thing, but we gave it a shot. My you know, we always looking for like a spiritual path, you know. And my father meant to do the right thing, you know. But he's like, "You guys be Jehovah's Witnesses over here. I'm gonna go to the Bronx and gamble and snort some blow over here." You know what I mean? So basically, it didn't work out, you know. So when he came to California, he got the job in Palm Restaurant, and then he sent for my mother, because they were, the, were going to get a divorce, you know, because she had it with the mafia, and he didn't come home and everything, the gambling. So he sent for my mother out here, and then uh, us kids, us, uh, us four kids stood with my grandmother, and him and my mother fell in love again at 17 years old. Like, it was beautiful. And, like, she, you know, they, so basically they got back together, so then he gets a condo in Encino, and then we live right next door to Michael Jackson, like this beautiful condominium. And he sent for us kids one by one, bought furniture for this condo. Michael was living in a condo? It was crazy, yeah, he was living in a yeah. condo. This is before he became. A beautiful condo in Encino. This is before Thriller. And then, it before and then Thriller. When we, yeah, when we first So moved. he lived on Havenhurst with yeah. the whole family The house. family lived on Havenhurst. But the stories you hear are true stories, like the father used to like beat them up and shit. So basically, he got a condo right next to us. I would see a Rolls Royce come driving in every day, and I'm like, who's in this Rolls Royce that lives with us? We were fascinated, because I was coming from New York, yeah, and then all of a sudden, we, we just got, came out of New York. We're in Encino. We in, and this big Rolls Royce. We were seeing this big black Rolls Royce every day. We're like, who is it? So one day, we pulled alongside of it, and the window was down. It was Michael Jackson. <laughs> I'm like, holy shit, it's Michael Jackson. This is right before he did the Off the Wall album, you know? Yeah. This is when Thriller. He, uh, Thriller. You know, yeah. when he you know, he was younger, you know, and um we talked to him and then we're like, Hey Mike, what's up? How you doing? and everything and he was nice. He got out of the car, we talked with Kaz, they hit it off, and uh he took pictures with us and uh yeah, next thing you know, he was living next door and then we were at the deli on the corner with Randy and hanging out with the Jack, you know what I mean? They were hanging out in this uh, you know, it was just and, and, then, I and, start, I, and yeah. then I started working at the palm with my dad. 
kid coming out of New York, and then the next thing, we got Johnny Carson there, Lucille Ball there, Milton Berle there. I mean, I was like, Danny Thomas there, I'm like, Frank Sinatra. I was like, is this really going on? He worked in the Palm as a busboy. They got him in. So he was making like $1,500 a week as a busboy at 17 years old. Okay? Yeah, that's crazy. I went to hairdressing school in New York. just as fast. <laughs> so, um, you know, because um, I quit high school the ninth grade. I was like, bye, Felicia. You know, because the school we went to, it was so bad. They, uh, they were turning over the principal's car. Okay? And it was really like the, the teachers were getting raped. You know? So basically... I just saw all that, and I'm like, you know what? So I always liked hair. So I was always doing hair since I'm young. My grandmother bought me the Barbie dolls, and then my father was coming home. We had to hide the Barbie dolls. Um, you know. So basically, I was like a ping pong boy. Like, should I play with the dolls? Should I not play with the doll? But growing up like that, you know, and then my aunts, my mother's sisters were all very beautiful, and fashion, 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 and I really believe that's how I got here, you know, through up 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, like all that fashion, you know, my mother was very beautiful and she always was trendy, trendy, trendy. So that's where I got it from, my mama, yes. Yeah, but, you know. but he started off as a, as a, as a hairdresser, a makeup artist, co like cosmetologist, and he worked at some of the best places in, in, in Manhattan and just like for the clothing thing. It's just people, are they had a line waiting for him. All the top people, the top Well, you're right, Mark. Like, you know, I would go to work in Manhattan, and there would be a line of people, just like the store. Like, I get all the celebrities, and I get all the kids and the trendsetters and everything. They come here. You're right. When I was, like, 16, 17, I got my hairdresser's license at 17 years old, young. Uh, because my father's like, if you're, you're going to quit school, you better go to beauty school. You got to do something with yourself. So he paid for the, my beauty school back in the day. I got my license, and I would just do like all the one hit wonders, like uh, Lisa Lisa, Brenda K. Star, all those 80s freestyle girls, you know? And um, there would be a line waiting for me, like when I come to, you know, when I, when I go to cut hair, if I showed up, because I was going, and after I was in, a, I was partying a lot. Is that when the drugs started? Yeah, drugs started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't cute. It was cute in the beginning. You know, it was like cocaine. You know, so I would go out Friday. That's why when we came to L.A., we didn't really want to stay in L.A. because there was nothing compared to New York City at that time, at 17 years old. I'm working in the village as a hairdresser. We're going to every nightclub. There's the punk rock scene, too. We're going to the punk, you know, CBGB's, Max's Kansas City. And then I was a just... Studio 54, Studio Red 50 Parrot. I mean, we, we, we just, you know, the fun house. Yeah. We had a so, great time. You know, New York... You know, no matter how fabulous great, great and Michael Jackson of it all, but New York was the place. So I kept on having to go back to New York, actually, to try to live there by myself. But my father always says, L.A.'s going to be your home and you're gonna become famous in LA Cosmo, you know? And at that point, I really didn't wanna hear it because New York was my heart. But, you know, during that process, um, I started going to after hours and I was picking up like cocaine and in the beginning it was fun. You know, I would go, but then I started like going out Friday night and coming home like Tuesday morning, you know? <laughs> and then like, <laughs> You know, like, and then I would walk out of the after hours and I would have a white leather outfit on, going in beautiful, and coming out and the leather outfit was black. And um, I remember coming out of the clubs and seeing the nuns, you know, uh, going to church, you know. And I was like fucking Dracula. I was like, get, you know, get me out of here. Where's the other after hours? I need, you know. But basically, the drug um, addiction progressed. Yeah, it went from powder. For you too, Joe? Yeah, yeah, we came out here, we, I got into it, it was in New York City, started getting into it, probably like, yeah, you know, dealing with it, uh, you know, uh, started doing it. Well, so it was New York. Started sniffing at first. I remember, you know, my, I was go, actually my dad was doing it, and then next thing you know, I was like going in my dad's pocket while he was coming home sleeping. I take his Lincoln Continental, <laughs> and I go in his pocket to take his blow, and I sell his blow, and I'm driving around with a Lincoln Continental at like what 14, 15 years yeah, old. So first yeah, I started yeah, yeah. selling it to everybody, you know, and then I just started doing it. I'm like, wow, this is great, man. I feel great. You know what I mean? 
And then, uh, you know, just it, it, it progressed. You know, it, it progressed. I was, at that point, I was goody two shoes. We just started doing it, you know? So I was like, no cocaine. I'm going to hairdressing school. I'm going to be this hairdresser and blah, blah, blah. And cocaine is bad. And, yeah, you know, a, and I was like that. And meanwhile, he's already doing cocaine. That, that was the blow days for sure. And, stealing and, I was, and I was an athlete, too. But you know what? We just, uh, you know. It fucked up a lot of it dreams. Was the, you know, it really it, did. It, it took its toll. Place. It was in the neighborhood. A lot of, you know, we did it, you know, and then it was fun. It, in the beginning, it was fun. The beginning, it was great. It was fun. We had a good time. We were sniffing. It was social. We were going to clubs. We were having drinks. We were dancing. You know, it was fun at one time. It was you know, the thing to do. And then it gets progressive. It just got crazy. And then when we moved to L.A., it was fun. I, at first, I didn't like it. I went back because I had a girlfriend in New York City. I went back, and then I came back. I left the Palm job. But the manager loved me so much. You know, my family was there, and I came back. He hired me back. So we were, in a, you know, and that, that, that was like uh, working in the Palm was like a snowstorm. Everybody was in the bathroom there. You know, you celebrate celebrities, everybody. I'm that sure was, Mark knows. That, that was there. And, Dan, then, you know, and Dan Tana, and then, did you ever go to Dan Tana's? Uh, Dan, it's well, next well, to the Palm. Well, all, all they still got all the all best steak in town, yeah. better than the Palm. But anyway. Still you know, there. Yeah. You know, the bathrooms, there was more people in the bathroom than there were at the, at the freaking tables. You know what I mean? But then uh, we, the, the, we, we got we got introduced to Alvarado Park. Oh my God! We found MacArthur's Park. We found you know MacArthur's yeah, Park. Yeah, half yeah. the people I interview are from MacArthur yeah. Park. Oh, this is back. How many years? Thirty years ago. Thirty. Thirty years, years ago. ago. Yeah. We, once we found that, and then we wind up doing. Uh, so that became the hangout. It wasn't the nightclubs anymore. It was MacArthur's Park. You know. And uh, so we found MacArthur's Park, and then we found out you could, like, actually, well, we found Freebase, okay? That was the big deal. It wasn't crack. It was Freebase. So I found that in New York, you know, and a few of my father's friends gave it to me, you know? Uh, when my father was out here, my father got really pissed off about that. Because, like, you're, you're Italian, you can kind of snort all the coke you want, but if you Freebase, it's taboo. It's like, no, no, no. So I started freebasing, and then I came out here, and then I didn't want to snore coke anymore. So somebody's like, go to MacArthur's Park. They have exactly what you need, what, what the doctor ordered. So I go, to Mac I go there first, huh? He told me, he told me. Joe, so I he, said, he, he dude, this guy, park, this guy just gave, to, took me to this park. MacArthur's Park, it's on a summer song. It's melting in the dark. You know, I'm like, it's perfect. Because we didn't know it was going to be that addicting. I didn't know it was going to be a fucking mess. And so it, was I, still, it was still fun at the time. You know, it was... It was it still was, having fun, finding MacArthur's Park. Also, all the gangsters living on the edge with the gangbangers. And I would go down there, like, you know, with my little hair and my little purse. Every time you went down there with him, all you hear was, Hollywood, Hollywood. Everybody knew him. Everybody's calling the street, Hollywood. So I was Hollywood. even popular in the drug world down there, you know. And they, they call me Hollywood, you know. You're popular everywhere you go. Yeah, it's crazy. Everywhere. It's crazy. You know, I'm the only queen that comes home with her wig, her purse, money in her purse. Yeah. And you know, they don't rob, Okay. As a matter of fact, my friend called me the other day, you know, and his name is Sinbad, and um, he was a gangster, a hardcore gangster. And he goes, I just want to tell you, he goes, thank God we're alive, Cosmo. He goes, thank God we're alive, he goes, and he goes, out of all the gangsters, and I'm talking like the Crips and the Bloods that hang out down there, and 18th Street, and this one, and that one, he goes, you had more balls. <laughs> he goes, you had more balls than anybody. He goes, anybody down Go there. Anywhere. So, it, I'm glad that Sinbad's still alive, because a lot of people are dead. They would find them in the lake down there. Yeah, there's a lot of bodies in that lake. They would drain the, the lake oh, and yeah. find carcasses. It's a beautiful park. But, but yeah. if you knew what goes on around that... With gangbangers. We were hanging out with 18th Street. We were just like... It was like... But you know what? We didn't care. And it was all celebrities coming in there too. Like, I didn't feel... Oh, yeah. It's, I didn't it's, feel oh, like... crazy down there. Yeah, I didn't feel like a scumbag because you would get like famous celebrities come in and hanging out and I smoke with a lot of them too on the grass for two days like in a row you know what I That's mean how crazy we were we were comfortable down there we liked yeah. it you so, know it was nuts yeah now we passed by the other day oh my god I showed you Gina and I said let's just go like a walk let's go for a tour around memory lane and you just see people on fentanyl like literally like it's a whole different vibe you know they're like literally dying on the grass literally dying you know and um i was like wow like this this park was always drug infested 
but I never seen like before we would all the crack makes you stand up right you know what I mean but now everybody's like fucking horizontal they're like zombies on the grass yeah, you know yeah. and it's really sad you know and it's like before it was more Mexican it was more like now it's like they're all white people like on the grass like dying from fentanyl you know so it's changed but it's still drug infested and it's really sad like you know what la is doing you know and what's it looks so pretty on the outside but meanwhile the inside is really like it's bad it's like the world it's the world los angeles needs help so world. bad you know so it's, it's not just la though right it's yeah world. it's all it's going on the whole, yeah. the whole country yeah, yeah it's the world yeah as but we he was know on it. cops one time <laughs> he was on the show cops <laughs> Because I, 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 I stopped going. I stopped. I moved to Florida. I had that moment of clarity. I said, yeah, Lord, what am I going to do? I remember, I, remember, I remember I settled a case. I was downtown, you know, getting high and everything like that. And I settled a case finally. So I have like 10000 in my hand, in my pocket. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I said, am I going to go freaking kill myself right now? I said, where am I going to go? So I just had that moment of clarity. I called a friend in New Jersey. I'm like, Michael, do me a favor. i got to come stay with you for a little while. So I was downtown. I bought an Amtrak. I went to New Jersey. And I, after that, I just got sober. I just stopped. But he kept going for like fucking 20 years. Yeah. He kept going. Yeah. So now I'm in Florida. So my twin brother left me. I'm in Florida. He left me. He's in Florida. And I heard he was on Cops. <laughs> and one day I'm falling asleep. I'm falling asleep. And I hear the episode. I hear Cosmo. I'm like, what the fuck? So I look at the thing, and, and everybody's calling me, thinking it's me because we're twins, and he has my sweatsuit on, he looks thug like me, you know what I mean? He's got the sweatsuit on. They're like, Joe, you're on cops, Joe. I said, that's not me, right? So I'm going to finally see the episode, and I'm like, oh, shit. So the cops, you know, he gets busted or whatever, and the cops go, ask him his name. He goes like this, Joseph Lombino. He gave my name. <laughs> So he's on cops. He looks like me. <laughs> and the cops asked his name. And, and, and no, because I knew I had a warrant. So I knew I would go away. So I knew if I said Joseph Lombino, it would be cool. But guess what? They said you had a warrant too. They said, but you know what? Sign, they said sign this release. So I would have signed anything because I had like all this dope in my mouth and I was talking to the camera and I was hoping a piece wouldn't fall out. I was praying. So they go, excuse me, sir, come over here, sign this paper. So I'm like, I'll sign anything. What is this? He goes, you just signed a release to show your face on Cops on an episode. He goes, you could go now. There you go. So they still keep on playing that same episode. This is 25 years later. I think that was the first year of Cops, you know, and they keep on playing. So all my customers are like, are you on Cops? I remember CeeLo called me. He's like, Cosmo, we just saw you on cops. <laughs> but it was like really, like, it was devastating. It didn't turn into an arrest? No, it didn't turn into an arrest. Because I signed it. Like, yeah, oh, I see. It was just for TV. It. Yeah, yeah, it was just, yeah. How, so, many, how many years were you doing all that craziness? Oh, the craziness? I, I, I didn't I, I'll be honest with you. I didn't stop the I craziness. I was so worried about him. But you know what? It's just amazing because he, he was able to, he always worked. And showed up the work, and he always maintained. Had like a maintain us. Well, like my father, my father would but, stay. But, was, but, but, listen, my what? father would stay up for nine days gambling, but he would work in the Palm Restaurant serving Johnny Carson. So he had to get it together and go to work. So we just have this crazy work ethic that I just had to keep on coming to Melrose and making my money, yeah. you know, and building my little name here, you know. Well, I was like so worried. About people that. didn't know what I was I, really except like for the cops thing. How many years have you had shops here? I've had the shop here for like 20, my own shop. I opened my own shop 25 years ago. Oh, really? 25 years ago. And that was right like right in the middle of my addiction. This one? No, not this one. This one's here. Uh, the, the Cosmo Show. This one's here 13 years. Mm. With, yeah. De with Deborah, remember? Deborah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, first store, the first store was called The Cosmo Show. And I opened it up and it was just like 10 years and... You know, I made a lot of money in that store. That's when Melrose was really popping. And um, remember China the Wrestler? China? Joni Laurel? Oh, did you ever inter interview her? No. Okay. Unfortunately, no, she's... No, she was gone before he... She's started. dead. But anyway, she did Playboy. The first time I met uh, uh, China, she looked like a man. She was like literally 300 pounds, her jaw. She wasn't very attractive at all. She came in the store and I tried to put something on her. It wouldn't fit. Like a men's four, 3X didn't fit oh, her. Huge. She was just big, 
right? Not pretty at all. Cut to 10 years later, I open my store and I see this beauty walk in and I'm like, she goes, Cosmo, it's Joni. And I'm like, oh my God, you're beautiful. She goes, I just did Playboy. And she gave me an issue and she signed it. And I'm like, this is like a different person. She's gorgeous, you know? So she started coming in, Joni in China, you know, China and her boyfriend, what was his name? Uh, X-Pac, no. X, uh, yeah, X-Pac. X, X-Pac, yeah, the wrestler? Yeah. Yeah. So they're buying all these clothes from me. Like, I'm telling thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, my first year with my own business, like, she kept me open. Like, I think she spent a million dollars that year. And then every time I look at People magazine, and she's wearing my clothes. So that was, like, a really big blow up, you know, with my first and that store. was when she was really hot, too. You know, she was really... Gorgeous. You know, yeah. Gorgeous. And then, then you know, the, then we started hanging out with her. We did a reality show. She was my trainer on the show, but she'd be up for nine days, okay? So she would get a bottle, a box of cornflakes. She'd go get, she would go in my kitchen in the morning, and the guys are there with the cameras trying to film a reality show on us, and she's my trainer on the show. So she shows up like Julie Andrews. Like, every time she showed up, she was so, she was so great. She was great on camera. And uh, every time she showed up, she was in a different outfit. And... Uh, yeah, we started hanging out with Joni, and she was hilarious. That show never got bought. You know, the producers had a fight over the footage. I don't know what happened. It wasn't time anyway, because I wasn't sober anyway, so it wasn't a good time. But, um, yeah, so we're hanging out with Joni. Uh, she liked Joe. She liked Joe. She was my girl. Yeah, yeah. She, yeah. Was, she was cool. i never forget one time we were hanging out. I came to I, Joe. I, I came to Florida. I came to California. I mean, I would party like rec recreationally, like here, like, you know, here and there. <laughs> and uh, my dad was going to see the Sinai for a heart attack, so he wound up getting an operation. They wanted to do an op. Thank God for seeing the Sinai. They kept him alive because he had so many uh, five heart attacks, aneurysm, uh, pacemaker, uh, angio, whatever stints. But that, thank God that hospital that kept them alive. Every time, every time we thought it was over, a new procedure, a new procedure. They, you know, they had uh, the doctor in there. But anyway, another, this, another time that I came to L.A. to go see my dad. He was in the hospital. They performed an operation, and thank God everything went good. And then uh, next thing we know, we Cosmo had a fashion show, and I'm hanging out with Joni. And uh, she grabs me in the bathroom. <laughs> she's fucking she's strong. She grabs me in the bathroom like this. She goes, Joey, come on. But she was... She was beautiful at the time. I swear, she looked so good. She was hot, man, really hot. She grabs me in the bathroom. She goes, all right, your dad's okay, let's party. She has a fucking bottle of Dom Perignon and she puts a fucking rock of cocaine like this on the fucking table. And she goes, let's party. I'm like, okay. And uh, we party, you know? So we had a good time. So cut to, yeah. we partied so much with Joni and then I just like never stopped partying with this clothing store. And then before you know it, we went to over her house. She lived on Wilshire, um, and Busta Rhymes lived on the bottom of her. So we would go over her house and party, but she was like a people pleaser. Like, if you liked her wrestling belt, she'd be like, here, take it, you know? So before you know it, every time I went up there, furniture was gone, all her wrestling belts were gone. I just seen, I just seen, like, the demise of Joni Laurel, you know? I just seen... And then before you know it, um, she, she died. Yeah. She yeah, she died. She, she, spiral. That was sad. Really she never got she never got the gift of sobriety. You know, she never got the gift, and it's really sad because she was like a big celebrity, and you know, and nobody really. Um, well, I, I know her sister tried to help her, put her in rehabs and stuff like that, but she wasn't ready. So anyway, you know, I miss her. She was like a good customer and a really good friend. Yeah, but. After that, so I have my own store on Melrose. This is embarrassing, but I'm going to tell you guys because you guys know I'm raw, raw, and um, <laughs> raw. So um, I have my store for 10 years, and then it's my birthday, you know, and I made all this money with Joni, and, like, I just, like, the store was very successful, my first store, and I have had it for 10 years, and then... Um, all of a sudden, it's my birthday, and I'm like, I'm going to go out for my birthday, but I'm going to party like a rock star because I never had that much money in my life.
So I said, I'm just going to go out and just do it balls and all, you know? So I was in Vegas, and I'm here in Beverly Hills Hilton, and partying, and freebasing, and I'm in Denver Garthas Park, and I'm behind a cardboard box, and just doing anything I wanted to do, like living the fantasy, you know, like that. And then before you know it, I couldn't stop. And I ended up with my friend, Aldo, who's definitely crazy, 5150, but he was so much fun. I, like, I, I couldn't stay away from him. We had so much fun. But he lived in a dual diagnosis building, right? So basically, next door was like the snake crack lady, and upstairs, this girl needed an exorcism. And, you know, and, we, it, and like, I was just like, I'm having the time of my life in this building. And, you know, it's like, oh my God. So basically, I never really left that building. You know, I spent like $60,000 in that building, you know, getting everybody high, you know. And then um, I would come back to Melrose, and my little cousin is working in my store, and she's like, bitch, you're losing your store. Like, you're lo you have to stop it now. You got to come home. She goes, you went out like eight months ago for your birthday. You never came back. <laughs> what the fuck? Stop it. So I'm like, just give me the money, girl. It's like, keep me open. It's okay. I thought, but I thought it would never end. Unfortunately, close to my birthday, the next year is when I came home because I ran out of all the money. And she's like, you, you lost your store. We tried to keep it open. You know, the landlord came and put locks on it, you know, and I just, so that was like, what? Like, that was really like, oh my God, like that, like I went into like psychosis. Like I just couldn't deal with it. Major depression, you know, uh, that no drug could fix, you know, and I tried to stay out there and numb those feelings, but I couldn't, you know, and I tried to even be homeless and I couldn't, you know, and it was just like, it just didn't work for me, you know? So I put myself in a rehab. I put myself in a rehab. This was like probably the fifth rehab, you know, the fifth one was a charm. And I learned how to live again, you know, and they told me how to wake up in the morning, brush your teeth. They like scrubbed your brain, you know, taught me how to live again because I was so self-will run riot like Miss Rebecca. Like I make her look like a Jehovah's Witness. OK, I was a maniac. I was hearing voices. Like, I swear I was hanging out with, like, Lindsay Lohan. And I was like... I, I didn't think there was any... I was hearing voices. I, I, was, I was like... Home for, really? Him. I and, thought he crossed that fine line that they talk about. There was no more coming home. Yeah. I thought he was gone. He was gone. His mind I was, was gone. I was gone. But you know what? He, he did come... He, thank I, God. I was you know, gone. The grace of God, whatever. He, he, he made it back. He came I made back. it back. I, I, and, I like, unscathed. Like, from MacArthur's Park. Like, ne not... Just unscathed. But mentally, I was, like, a mess. Like, I was, like suicidal like i would put myself in you know in the hospital and be like i'm suicidal like literally like i couldn't believe what i did you know when the high was over and there was no more money for drugs and then all those people were gone you don't have any friends they're just around you because you have drugs you know and uh it became a big old mess so anyway um i got sober yeah i went away got sober came back out came back to melrose um, started working with my friend in her store. I built myself up again, basically, and then opened another store, you know, and I did it the right way, and I make sobriety come first, you know? And cut to a few years later, um, I started relapsing. Because, you know, when you get everything back, you just, like, become, you know, complacent. You're putting the... The, the, the AA meeting is on hold. You're like, okay, I got this now. You know, I'm, I'm sober. <clears throat> so you put the AA meeting, and then, then you stop making the phone calls, and you stop calling your sponsor and doing what I have to do every day to keep the spiritual awareness. I stopped doing that. And literally right back, I was like, you know what? I think I could have that drink. I'm going to go have a drink. Yeah. You know, when you have a good, when you have an idea, God laughs, okay? So... I go have a drink, before you know it, and so another drink, another drink, another drink. Before you know it, I'm back smoking again. Smoking, you know, now it's not free base, it's fucking crack. Okay, let's be real. So I'm smoking this and, um, and I'm, you know, and then I'm just, but basically I'm maintaining. I'm being very functional. I think I'm maintaining, right? 
So I'm still coming to work, and I'm still doing the store, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, you know. And Wait, when you're in when you're in that state of mind, is there any like, could Joe tell you, hey, look, you're out of control, you need to stop it? Nobody. Or, nobody. There's nothing you could do. Yeah, sorry, no, sorry. he was out of his mind. You couldn't There's stop him. You could do. All I could do, I, and then I was, in, you know, I was, I was living somewhere else, and I was just. You know, all you could do is pray. You know, pray, to, pray, yeah. pray, pray. I didn't think he was going to get it. I'll yeah. be honest. He, he, he got so that, there he were got that, he got that crazy, that yeah. bad. I mean, he lost his mind. Yeah. And I was just like, how many times I came out here, and then he, West Cos, you know, and, 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 we don't know. Well, I didn't get to the sarcosis the second time. Thank God it was a very short run. Okay, because first of all, I couldn't get high right anymore like as soon as i got high i got super paranoid and i would like lock myself in a closet so it wasn't fun anymore before i was running around but once you got a head full of aa and you're sober and you're living like the guilt would just overwhelm me it would overwhelm me that stage it's, it's not fun anymore yeah it's like what they said what's a, a, a pickle becomes a cucumber or you know it can never, yeah. it can never go back. You know, that's that's the way. That's the way it is. <laughs> that's, that's the reality of it. You know. But so anyway, but I'm trying to maintain. I mean, thank God. It. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we just. Yeah. So I'm trying to maintain it. You know, and then like everybody's like, you know, you need to go back to meetings. You're gonna lose this store too, Cosmo. Like you know, and like the fucking disease is insidious. Like it's just waiting for you in the parking lot doing push-ups to fuck you up. Like you know, you could like relapse. I don't care how many, how many, how many years you have. You know what I mean? It's like you're you're this close if you don't take care of yourself to a relapse, really. So now I see the relapse before the relapse before the relapse. I see it, you know, and I try to avoid it. I run the other way like the plague because I know that that disease is going to I'll end up dead. But what do you think when you see somebody like Rebecca? Oh, uh, when I see Rebecca, like I saw her just on the, before I came here. I was telling Joe before you yeah, showed up. Crazy. Oh, you Rebecca did. came I don't to know my if there's any uh, hope for her. I mean, well, how is how is Rebecca? The same train wreck she's always yeah. been. And, and, you know, she comes begging for money, and I'm just like, no, I can't be part of this anymore. Yeah. I just can't. Yeah. You're just enabling well, her Well, that you know, that didn't, that didn't help me. Like I told you, like, my parents literally, like, left apartments. They just left. Like, I would come home. My mother would give me money. She oh, would, she we, would were living at them, we were living with them at one time, okay? We were off, me and him on a binge. We were off for a weekend. We, we, went, we went back to the house. They moved. They moved on us. They moved. They didn't even tell us. Yeah. Please. Yeah. We went to the house. There was nobody there. They moved. They, they moved. didn't tell us nothing. They moved. They didn't tell us what they Because they were our biggest enablers. My mother, my father, not so much. <laughs> my mother would come back from Ralph's and just give, her, give us money. And, you know, we go out and smoke they some more. Enablers, yeah. Smoke some more. So anyway. I used to party with them. We're sitting down doing cocaine, and, you know, with, with my dad. And my mom's drinking. And, you know, and then there's people over the house. I mean... It was crazy. It was normal. And then, and then my dad, who he started getting sick, he got a heart attack, he would get an operation, heart attack, and then he's coming back out, and he's like, doing the same shit again. I'm like, I couldn't have no part of it. I'm like, Dad, yeah. I can't do this anymore, man. So I just like bounced, I bounced, I wind up going, that. Like, that's when I left. Yeah, and- um, Rassiano. You know, I, kept, I left and they kept going, he kept going, and you know, and then all I could do was like, you know, Pray, you know, pray for them, and then you know, I, I wind up having my own family, and uh, you know, just to, but you know, thank God that it's a miracle that we're both that we're that we're both here. But there's a mir a real miracle that he's here, and um, you know, it, but that 24 year old, 20, Rebecca's 24, right? 24 or five, something like that. 26, maybe. 26. I didn't want to hear anything about so sobriety. I really didn't. I, I was just getting started. You know, so basically, but I wasn't in the bushes like that. You know what I mean? And I did have a little schizophrenia. But, I think, I think the drugs are but she's drugs like, are different than she's the, really dual diagnosis. She's really sick. So I had to be ready. I had to be ready. Like people try to like tie me up. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of problems that people don't see in the videos I shoot with Rebecca. The problem is much worse than it appears. Yeah. yeah. You're seeing, you're sitting, you're sitting in a stool, talking to a camera. Everything seems under control. It's totally out of control when she's off camera. Yeah. Totally out of control. Yeah. And I saw that. I saw that. <coughs> I saw the sickness. I saw the disease of addiction. But I also saw we're self-centered. Self-centered. So basically, it's me, me, my, mine. So basically, I, I also saw a little spoiled cunt. 
is what I saw. You know what I mean? And uh, like after we were filming, like I felt bad and was hoping I made that connection with her with all my heart. And like, you see, I could tear because it's like I seen that we did make a little connection with her. But but, she, yeah. but after that, you know, I remember I seen her in the dressing room. Get me this. Yeah. Get me that. Well, she was get me this. Way. I want this, I want that. And I was like, oh, she's an entitled, spoiled right. cunt well, smart on top too, of it. She knew she had an ace in the hole with you also because you were helping her out, giving her money, doing this. And she, actually what you're doing is enabling her. You yeah, know what yeah I mean? it, it was that meeting here with you combined with the following week. Like, I just realized that's exactly what she is. She's just she's a yeah, spoiled she's little a, brat. She's, a, she's an addict. You know? Even yeah, my yeah. Si Listen, my sister, let me tell you something. I have a friend that has a kid that has autism, okay? So basically, okay, it's sad the kid has autism. It's a disease, right? You know, and it's like, you know, it's like, but the kid, when he was getting older, he's like, well, I'm going to shit on the walls and I don't care what you say, you know what I mean? And I'm not going to wipe my ass. I'm not going to go to the bathroom. I'm just going to shit on the floor. So even this kid with a disease like alcoholism, autism, you know what I mean? He seen that he could get if he can get away with it. So basically, it was like, um, so basically, it's like you know you have this disease, right? But you know anybody, it's very self centered. So basically, the kid tried to get away with it with his mother, but the mother finally put up. You know, she's like, that's it. She took the kid in the room, gave the kid a beating. You know, in my day, in my back in my day, you you give your you give your kid a beating. You know, so basically, the kid is more disciplined now, and he's like the best kid. He's older now, but anything with any disease, like you're like, oh, you know, it's not their fault. It's what they do. No, drug addiction is so self centered. That's why she was like, get me this, and I want this, and you know, and now I I got a phone, and I want this outfit. You know what I mean? So it's, it's the, the worst thing to do is basically enable. So basically, that, that I think that was Rebecca's problem. And when they stopped enabling me, when my mother stopped giving me money, my friends stopped giving me money, they're shutting the door. First of all, you have no friends. When you're broke, you're a joke, okay? So Rebecca can't buy these boys drinks at the Abbey anymore, right? So what's left to do, right? She's either going to hit a bottom, like I hit, you know, when I was cut off, or, you know, there's another choice, there's another alternative too. You could just die out there. You know, because it's, it's a bottomless pit. It's bottomless. So hopefully, you know, she's okay. But I'm glad to hear that you let her go a little bit. Not I mean, a little bit. That's yeah. be, that's be you a cut her off. That's cut her off. That's got to be a relief 100%. for you. You got to feel relief, you know. Yeah, well, I, I, like, unless somebody's in my life making it better, right? you have no business being in my life. Exactly. Exactly. And Rebecca makes my life worse in every she way. She's a headache, Yeah. Yeah. But did you know a little bit about the enabling thing? Oh, for sure. I heard that you. Sure. I, heard no, you I, I, I heard you were dealing with her for is it six years? Yeah, or? but not giving her money like sporadically over the course of a year, mm. like three, four times over the course of a year, I'd give her some money. Right. And then lately, it's becoming more and more, and that's when things just got worse and worse. And I'm like, I'm, I'm out. Yeah. Good. That's no, no. I mean, yeah. it's much less than people imagine. Like I see in the comments, people think I'm I'm enabling. Yeah. I wasn't enabling anything. Good. I was giving her money for like four interviews a year. Look how many interviews there were. That's how many times I would, would help her out with with maybe a hundred bucks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's that's. But, but yeah. it, lately it's gotten more and more, and that's when. Right. I right. Just, I had to pull you the plug. Had, you had to put a stop. You pull the plug. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad. No, but she had so many opportunities here. You, you even offered her a job. She didn't take that. I offered her like the social media thing. She would have loved that. Yeah. Didn't take that. I offered her rehabs. Yeah, turned she, down three she, of those. She, she needs. She needs mental help. She needs help. No, I know. I, mean, I know. Yeah, she, it's it's she more than just I, like she's making mistakes. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't and know. She's if entitled. You know. I hope to God that she comes. But I don't think yeah. she's coming home with, from. But she might hit. A, a she might hit a bottom. You know, faster. You never know. You know. She, you never know. God lives on the corner. You know. People like threw me away. My parents threw me away. They upped and moved. I had nowhere to go. And I, you know, and I try going downtown and doing doing a pulling a Rebecca, you know, and like living downtown, and you know that bakery is going to give me food, and Starbucks is going to give me coffee, and I'm going to go to the YMCA, take a shower. It was brutal, brutal. What what what, what finally got you clean? I just couldn't like my my spirit couldn't wasn't right with it. 
You know, it wasn't right with it. Like my soul wasn't. How, right. how long did that second relapse last? That second relapse. Okay, so what happened was, um, I go to a fashion show. Okay. And I was hiding it really well, the relapse, by the way. I was just getting real skinny. And um, I went with my, my boyfriend. <laughs> and I had a beautiful boyfriend that I met in San Jose. You know, you got to be careful because the boys will take you out too, people. I'm telling you, especially when they're cute. So anyway, I go to the fashion show with this boy. And you know, we're, we're really loving on each other. You know, it was kind of like love at first sight. It was beautiful. And then... Um, I do, I, I, you know, my, my fashions come out and everybody's applauding and they're like Cosmo paparazzi and I was living my best life, right? Hiding the fact that there, there was like, you know, I was relapsing. Uh, oh no, I try to get sober again. I'm sorry. I try to get sober and then, um, I see him with a drink in his hand and I'm like, what is that? He goes, vodka. I says, but you know, we're supposed to be getting sober here. Because he would party too a little bit, you know. And I'm like, you know what? Give me that drink. And then it was off to the races. It was off and running. We were Bonnie and Clyde. We were all over Los Angeles. It was another ride. Uh, hotel room, hotel room, hotel room. Um, and uh, it was like, it didn't last for long, right? Because something really bad happens. And we were in a car accident you know, and it didn't end up too well, you know. And I'm just going to say that I am still devastated about, like, what happened. And, you know, he went to jail, you know, for two years. And um, so basically when they tell me, they tell you the, the, the disease gets progressively worse, like there's no end to how bad it gets, you know. It, it literally goes to the, you know, the gates of hell. And that's what happened to me. You know, it's like you keep on touching that stove, Cosmo, you touch the stove, you're going to get fucking burnt. And something really bad had to happen for me to, like, stay sober, you know, and, um, you know, still going for, you know, for therapy over that and still, you know, um, working through it, you know. But thank God, like, he's out. He's still beautiful. And then since then, you've... Uh since then, You've I got my shit together. And yeah. running these stores. Yeah. yeah. You have three stores now? I have three stores now. Yeah. Um, Cosmo Donato, uh, Cosmo's Glam Squad. And then a few years ago, I thought it was a good idea to open a shoe store in Melrose because there were no like glamour shoes. It was all sneakers, 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 sneakers. So I'm like, let's open up a shoe store. There's no more shoe stores. Because during the protest, um, they came and they burnt everything down. So I got a shot at a good rant, and I'm like, okay, let's open the shoe store. Um, not a great idea. A man cannot live on shoes alone, you know, and versus the internet, you know. Um, and I thought it was going to be a total hit. So basically, it's a, it's a struggle. It's a struggle, and since Burning Man, it's been a struggle. You know, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, you know, people see me and they're like, oh, you must live in Beverly Hills, and you must be like Liberace and have a piano in your house and everything. No, that is not the case. Yeah, I do live. I have a beautiful house and three dogs, you know. I do live, you know, but it's far. It's not, you know, right now it's a little, um, try, I'm like trying to catch my tail. You know, it's like really rough on Melrose because of COVID that put us back um, because of not having Burning Man's the last four years. Last year there was Burning Man, but only half of the people went. So none of the people, the money people are coming to Melrose, you know. And then um, also after the protest, when they were like robbing people, Melrose got a really bad name, you know, and people are like literally afraid to come here, you know. So that actually slowed me down, you know? So it's like, what do I do? So here I am, right? I'm like, okay, I, now I got this food addiction. I've gained some weight. And I'm like, um, I don't want to be in front of a camera. But then I'm just seeing the numbers go down in the stores. And I'm like, I can't lose those stores on Melrose. I've been here 40 years. I can't go out without a fight. So thank God my friend Eugenia, she goes, Cosmo, like, you're beautiful. Like, who cares you gained a few pounds? Like, let's get in front of the camera 
and let's just do like you know you know YouTube and you're gonna do these shows and you're gonna go viral and I'm like girl no nobody nobody wants to see you know Chubby Cosmo you know and um, she's like no bitch they love you like the way they love you in the store they're gonna love you so basically um, my friend Brandon was on Mark's show and it went viral the way he was talking about Cosmo how I helped him get sober. So I, you know, and I was like, everybody's calling me. Brandon's talking about you. You help him get sober. You, are you, you know? So we went viral. So Brandon's like, you need to go on Mark's show. You know, you need to go on Mark's show. He goes and talk solution. You know that you could be a crackhead, hang out downtown. You know, hear voices, have a yeast infection, and still like get sober. <laughs> So, you know, and it's like, you know, it's a struggle, but it, it can be done, you know? So um, I go on Mark's show, you know? And I tell my story like I'm speaking at an AA meeting, you know? And a lot of people are like, oh, don't mention AA and don't do this and don't do that. But every time you put on TV, there's a TV show that totally mentions AA right now, you know? So it's like, you know, the old folks frown upon it. But I'm just proud to say AA has got me sober, and I'm a drug a drug addict. But I just put like drugs and the you know the in, 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 you know and um you know in front of AA. But basically, you know, it helped me a great deal. And in LA, there's a big you know AA community. There's so many meetings a week. So anyway, went to Mark, did the show with Mark, and then after that, uh. I, I go on YouTube and like, you know, and my phone and it's like, I just start going like crazy viral. But Mark also helped me too. He, I mean, he knew how you need people to give you a nudge, you know? And he told me, he goes, you're a star. <laughs> you know, he basically, sometimes you need people to believe in you for you to believe in yourself again, you know? And I want to start with Eugenia. She's the one who films me every day. Every day, every day, tells me how beautiful, she's loves me so I love myself. She's great. You have a great assistant. You know, I, I'm so lucky to have her, and it's really like, you know, it's, it's yeah. And then, um, you so now. You haven't even seen, you haven't even seen viral yet. What? I'm going to cry, Mark. <laughs> Fucking Mark. What the fuck, but Mark? I can't, I can't believe what happened in two weeks since, since your interview with your show. I mean, it's crazy. No, I mean, that wasn't really viral. That was just an average interview. <laughs> but, but you know what? But people are calling. I mean, it's crazy. People want T-shirts. They want uh, they want Cosmo. Like yesterday. They were getting movie deals. Where people are calling for major networks. They want this. I, I, I mean... It's been these last two weeks. It's just been. A, I just can't believe it. It's just a world. It's like my dream off comes true. Off like I always knew. Like I had magic, you know, and I always knew I had a gift, you know. And now I'm hearing things like you're a legend and you helped me out so much. And like you know, even your hair looks like Farrah Fawcett. <laughs> <laughs> so these are all things that I wanted to hear growing, growing up, you know. And it's like this is all possible now. And Mark saw it. He really did, you know. I think you're seeing just the beginning of it all. And I think if you turn the cameras around, guy, Mark got tears in his eyes. Right oh, I know. <laughs> That's why you could tell he's you, a good you, mother, you, he's you, a good you, soul. Eugenia, show, show your face. Eugenia. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You're great. You just needed, he's the right everything. You just need the right packaging and the right sauce. And we're doing the sauce. The but secret you were, sauce. The, but you were the it, so it's not me. It's just you. No, but I could do it without her. I'm telling you. Like, you, she worked for me you before. You guys are a great team. All three of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all, and all, all four Joe of you. Too, all, and then Donato, and yeah, it's yeah, just it's so four. happy that, that. She came in here selling me an octopus bra. <laughs> She's a designer, too. She's like the fucking Martha Stewart of design. And she comes in here, and it's Burning Man, and I see this couture octopus bra with tentacles coming out of it. It was the weirdest fucking thing I ever saw, but it was so couture, I really just met her that day, and I'm like, oh my God, she's so talented. And she never left the store. That's what happens with the store. Once people come, you don't leave. <laughs> you don't. Like, people, there's tourists that come in, they're like, this is better than Disneyland, Universal Studios, any nightclub, and they just keep on coming back, you know? You, like you, offered, that, you offered that to Rebecca, and she just, just turned her back. and. Went. Yeah, poor Rebecca. Like, I hope she gets it together. I really pray for her. But like I said, when I was 24, I was just getting yeah, started. Yeah, she's, she's a kid. But she's like... She, 20, 26. Yeah. But, but still, she's been, still young. But she's been doing it for a long time, right? It, well, I've known her for three years. Yeah. 
But she looks like she, when I ended up in the bushes and in a cardboard box and like shitting my pants, that's kind of when I said I can't do this anymore, you know? So she's already there. So hopefully she hits her bottom and she gets better, you know? But cutting her off is the best thing to do. Yeah. No, there's, there's no, I'm like, when, yeah. I, when I do that yeah. stuff, I do it. Yeah. So, um, I'm yeah. But thank God, my brother moved back last year from Florida. And, you know, it's so funny growing up with Joey. Whatever I went through, he went through. You know, he could be in Florida. And I'm like, Joe, are you mentally feeling fucked up? And he's like, yeah, I'm fucked up. Uh, Joe, I'm sick with the fucking bad flu or whatever. He's sick with the bad. It's like, it's so weird with this twin thing, how we have like this tele telepathy. Yeah. This connection. Big time. And then when he gets in trouble with the law, I get in trouble with the law. It's crazy. And then when he gets a little, you know, like, you I know. I get sick, he gets sick. Yeah. I'll be thinking about him, he calls me. Yeah. It's crazy. So he, he was gone for like 20 years, raising two beautiful kids. I have two beautiful nephews, you know. But now they're men now. They're going to come out too. But, you know, I told my brother Joe, you know, he was having a hard time in Marco Island, Florida, you know. I, and I, then, I, the, I, you know, the, the hurricane took... The White condo, out. the car, everything. He only he didn't get back. I had a transportation business. My my cars floated in the Gulf of Mexico. I, I literally floating in the Gulf of Mexico. This was a, yeah, it was a really bad hurricane. So he called me and he says, "You think I could come out?" And I'm like, "Yeah, you're my brother. Like you're my twin. You know, you're my other half. Come out." And I'm so glad he's here too because I love my brother. <laughs> I love my brother. <laughs> And, um, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, we're just really close. And then, uh, now here we are, full circle, you know. And he helps me in the store. He's amazing. Customers love him. You know, he's passionate, too, about selling and styling. And he's so good at it. But he always was competitive. You got, you got to be competitive in this business and you want to be the best, you know. And he was always really good at paddleball, too. <laughs> so, you know, he's, he's Not great. as good as you, but it was, it, paddleball was a sport. Everything else was me, but yeah. uh, he, was, he, was, he was an amazing paddleball player. A legend. From so I'm, I'm glad he's back. You know, plus he walks my dogs every morning, you know. And he helps me out so much. He really, really does, you know. So I'm glad I'm getting this little uh, success, you know, because I see the light at the end of the tunnel. I feel like I don't have to close my stores. You know life's, I mean? a, life's an interesting journey, isn't it? Where it's you get these, a, all these twists and turns and... Just when you think it's all over, something resurrects you. And yeah, like who knew? Like who knew this would have happened overnight too? Like go viral overnight on Twitter. I have 15 million views in two weeks. <laughs> Everything he does goes crazy. You know, and, and I'm at the Madonna concert, and I just said, "Put the camera on me right now." I'm so fucking pissed off. And I said, fucking Madonna, you had me walking two miles to pay for parking, 80 bucks. I don't know whether to smoke a cigarette or fucking whatever. I forgot what I said, but it went viral, crazy viral. But all starting with the soft white underbelly and Mark, you know. No, it's um, all you. It's all you. Yeah. Oh, my God. No, it's so you, you just need the right. You, Mark. You, you, you put us. You just, uh, you you just need the right the exposure. You got the world to see Cosmo. Really. He's a character. He should be seen. Yeah. And you, you're going to be the stud now. <laughs> now I can rent you out. You guys, are, you guys are a great team. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your stories. You are so welcome. You Mark. guys are a lovely pair. Uh, and your stories are great. I hope we gave you what, what you uh, wanted. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Yeah, and more. No, yeah. my, my audience was great. They wanted more from you, so. But we could do part two. <laughs> this is part two. We could do the, <laughs> the ex-boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. That was Thanks, great. Mark. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. That was awesome.